Okay, so this is the next video uh, going over the presentations for IB Design Technology. Remember the um, instructions as far as the colors of the text and the slides are background uh, dark like this. Uh, it's based off of the 2009 standards background light. It's based on the new 2016 standards and students who are going to be taking the IB test next year or any years thereafter are going to want to pay uh, especially close attention to that, but everyone should really pay attention to all of this. First thing we're going to talk about today is defining uh, invention and innovation. Invention is basically uh, creating something new for the first time. It's never been used before, it's never been created. Uh, this is actually coming up with the process or product right from the beginning. Innovation is either improving, uh, improving on an existing product or making a significant contribution uh, towards a product or service, or it can be the commercialization of an invention. Um, that link uh, is a two-minute video uh, from an entrepreneur, Tom Grasty, basically explaining invention and innovation and giving examples uh, from an entrepreneurship uh, standpoint. So make sure you go and watch that video linked right in the presentation. Um, now with the new standards uh, for IB, they're talking specifically about um, so there's, there's a lot of crossover that they're bringing over into the new standards. Um, invention uh, is something specific that they want you to be aware of. Uh, invention by it can be by lone inventors or in collaborative and creative teams. Um, that's usually uh, considered the forefront of design. Um, designers need to be both uh, creative and innovative, but also understand uh, concepts that will make a new product viable. Um, that's kind of going more into the um, innovation uh, area, but it is still important for invention as well. And also designers need to be need to use imagination, but they also need to be firmly grounded uh, in knowledge of the product and understanding how it's how it works. So they need to be both creative uh, thinkers and scientific thinkers. Uh, looking at international mindedness, you need to understand the role of intellectual property, IP, and patents uh, in either stifling or promoting inventions globally. Um, there's a, it's, it's a huge um, topic that needs to be addressed in the coming generations on the role of intellectual property and, and IP and patent laws and all these things because there's a lot of arguments for and a lot of arguments against. Um, so it, it, it's, it's particularly a buzzword uh, in, the, um, in the community. So that's going to be uh, something that you really want to understand for this. And then linking this to theory of knowledge, uh, what's the role of imagination and invention? And are there limits to what can be uh, imagined? And what are the unforeseen consequences of some of these inventions? So you need to consider the thought process that goes behind everything and also making sure that inventions are grounded in ethical reasons. Innovation um, is uh, particularly when uh, inventions are successful in the marketplace because they're uh, solving long-standing problems or improving on existing uh, solutions or finding what's known as a product gap, which is uh, an area that has yet to be filled by a product. Um, constant evaluation and redevelopments of products is key uh, for proper innovation. There are certain products that are out there that are constantly developed and redeveloped and, and re-released and you'll see this a lot in uh, fast moving technologies uh, like cell phones, computers, that sort of thing. Um, but it, it's also with uh, several other things um, where there's innovations in a particular product line. And big word here is, or big phrase here is commercial opportunities. That's also critically important to innovation. Uh, international mindedness, again, very similar to invention. They have both positive and negative co uh, consequences in countries. Um, so you have to be aware of basically the whole product cycle from uh, beginning design, production, and use and disposal. So how is that a affecting uh, the environment and the economies of countries all around the world? Design is always looking to the future and new development. Are there other areas of knowledge that are universal? Are there timeless truths or are they const constantly in flux? Um, basically just look at uh, design through kind of a TOK perspective here. What are the stages of innovation? Um, there's four main stages. First, develop an idea into a viable product. 
you produce the product, you market and sell the product, and then you redesign. Uh, that process needs to be repeated as frequently as is needed to keep a product profitable, profitable and uh, good in the marketplace. Uh, science and invention and innovation are kind of, uh, they go hand in hand. Science explained how the world is. They explained, uh, it explains kind of um, the natural world and, and the physical world. Use of that knowledge uh, creates new products that uh, can be invented and innovated. And if you look at that article uh, on the BBC's World Service, they have a list of scientific breakthroughs and a lot of the engineering advances that they led to, talking about uh, breakthroughs in everything from uh, genetics to electronics. It's all pretty much on there. There's quite a few things, so I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, technology uh, is different than science. Technology under uh, uncovers new possibilities uh, for materials and manufacturing techniques and processes. That's not to be confused with science. Science is more of a natural world. Technology engineering are more of the man-made world. Uh, new technologies can improve capabilities of products and or reduce co production costs or the cost of ownership. That's kind of a big thing these days is uh, reducing um, consumption, uh, basically causing um, or, or finding new ways to uh, reduce the cost of things or reduce production costs or operation costs. Why do the majority of inventions fail to become innovations? Um, in this in this perspective, um, with inventions, you really have to look at marketability. Um, marketability is probably the first and the biggest one. Is is it? You know, do people want it? Uh, an invention can be made. A lot of inventions are made, but if no one wants it, then it's not going to do very well. Um, financial support is also critical. If there's not enough people who are willing to buy in, not enough investors who are willing to make this thing get off the ground, uh, marketing, basically getting the information out to the proper markets. Uh, again, uh, need for invention and marketability kind of go hand in hand. Price, uh, is, it, is it affordable to the consumers? Is it worth their time and effort to earn the money to buy your product? Um, resistance to change. Some demographics don't want to uh, give up what they have in favor of something new just for the sake of having the newest thing. And then again, another thing with consumer psychology is aversion to risk. People might not be willing to try a new product because they might not um, want to take the chance of, of giving up something that they've come to become used to. Explain the relevance of design to innovation. Um, for innovation, and especially re-innovation, products need to be constantly redesigned um, in, in order to maintain market relevance. Um, things that don't move, don't advance, don't change will, will disappear from the marketplace. Uh, so design is critical uh, for innovation. Um, products that do not take advantage of new technologies, new materials, new methods, uh, they don't stay relevant. Uh, when the touch screen became popular, um, there are several cell phone companies that started making use of these touch screens, but then there's this one company called Blackberry that decided, you know what, we're going to stick with our method. They didn't adapt and now where are they? Uh, define the following. Dominant design. This is a critical thing to understand. Dominant design is a design of a product that becomes so pervasive, so recognized, uh, that uh, manufacturers and consumers will sometimes uh, say that something is necessary um, for a particular product line. Uh, we'll get into that in a few minutes. Um, diffusion into the marketplace is basically how accepted a product becomes. Market pull uh, basically says that the market or the demographic wants something, so they are looking for something, they're demanding a product, versus technology push, where that is a little bit different, it's a, where there's a new technology that's developed, so um, uh, producers and manufacturers will make something using the new technology, and they give that to the market, and then that may uh, inspire a market pull, but sometimes it doesn't necessarily have to. So there's two, basically two reasons that a new product will become developed. Either the market demands it or technology uh, kind of forces it upon the market. Classic design uh, is, is very similar to dominant design, um, but a classic design is something that is not just defined on how well uh, it functions or its impact, but it's something that can be recognized from from 
anyone in the perspective. Think of the Coke bottle. Um, anyone, the Coke bottle is is a very uh, recognizable shape. Anyone can show a, just the figure of a Coke bottle, and everyone will know what it is. Uh, international mindedness again cl classic designs like that coke bottle are recognized across cultures and they can hold iconic sta status you you take the coke bottle bottle everyone knows what that shape is you take the the shape of mickey mouse the head and the ears everyone knows what that is those are those are classic designs those are just icons of consumerism uh, when you consider TOK, classic design uh, can also appeal to emotions, uh, and are those emotions universal? Again, the Coke bottle was originally thought to be kind of a, a feminine shape, that's where, where it came from, and that was an emotional pull that they tried to bring into that, um, that product. Describe a design context where dominant design is relevant. Um, these are the examples they give. Uh, ballpoint pen, the iPod, Coke, like I said, a clamshell style laptop and disposable cups. Um, I drew that in paint in 10 seconds and that is pretty obviously, at least to me, an iPod. Um, every, when, for a while, when those things first came out, everyone was copying off of that exact shape. Even if those, that wheel didn't work the same way, so many knockoff MP3 players came out that looked exactly like that. Um, because that was such a dominant design. Um, if you think of laptops, you probably all have them sitting on your desks right now. Uh, they all function the same way. A laptop is th it has a screen that folds up. Well, now there are tablets, so that's changing, but for many, 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 many years, laptops all meant you had a keyboard that laid flat and then a screen that folded up. Where did that design come from? Why, why was it not maybe a fixed screen and a fixed uh, keyboard. Well, that clamshell design became such a dominant design that everyone copied off of it. Again, disposable cups too, same thing. They're all shaped the same way. They all pretty much work the same way. It's become such a dominant design that it's universally recognized. And then jumping back to the term classic design, um, this is where you have form that follows function as a fundamental principle, but it's not necessarily evident in practice. Uh, the laptop, the, the clamshell laptop is a great example of the form following the function because when it's closed you're actually blocking off all the keys, you're protecting the keys, you're protecting the screen, but when it's open you can have access to all of those and it, it, it works the way it is. Can you imagine what a laptop would be like if it was just permanently open? It would be very, even if it was really light, it would be extremely difficult and port, uh, not very portable for most people. Um, a lot of them, some products are so well designed that that um, it's intuitive on how to use them. You could probably give a person who's never seen a laptop in their life a laptop and they'd know, okay, this is kind of what you're supposed to do with it. This is how you're supposed to open it. They'd have a pretty basic understanding of it, but they would still, it's fairly intuitive on how to make it work. <coughs> Considering international mindedness, um, you, you need to be aware that sometimes old styles are coming back. Retro styling, um, new technologies is, is becoming um, more and more popular and that's because it ties directly to an emotional response where people um, are nostalgic for old things. If You, you, you could probably find um, new uh, like like MP3 stereo systems, not MP3, but like modern stereo systems uh, that have wood paneling on them. And that's because, you know, back in the 70s when those were really big, a lot of them were in wood cabinets. And that the, that old styling is coming back because there's that nostalgia value. Uh, people are trying to make things look old so they can, you know, kind of think back to, to that thing. And blinking TOK is aesthetics purely subjective. Uh, or there is there some objective, comp objective component to, um, to uh, aesthetics. Uh, we will continue this in the next video because we're running out of time here. So open up the next video when this one's done. Thanks.